Hello, this is Graphic Policy Radio, where comics and politics meet. This is your host, Ilana Levin, and this is a comics podcast. This is the comics podcast for people who know that comics, like all art, are inherently political, even when they're just quote-unquote guys in tights punching each other, and that all comics are art, even if that art sometimes has too many pouches and not enough feet. And while all of this is true regardless of the particulars, today we are talking about one comic that everyone recognizes as both art and politics. Yes, the time has come to talk about Mouse by Art Spiegelman. I'd avoided covering Mouse on the podcast till now. Undoubtedly, this is one of the most important comics ever. But when I tell people I host a podcast about the intersection of comics and politics, people say, oh, like Mouse. As if that is the one political comic worthy of discussion. Like I sit here every week and we just talk about Mouse every week since 2012. Hey, did you know comics aren't for kids anymore? Wow, guys, what a great concept for a podcast. If that was the show, I would probably lose my mind and you would not listen either. I am hosting a roundtable about Mouse now because Mouse is in the news again. A school board in Tennessee is banning it. But look, if you're listening to this podcast, you already know that it's anti-Semitic to ban a graphic novel that's the memoir of a child of Holocaust survivors telling the story of his parents' experience of the Holocaust. You don't need me to tell you that. But what you might be looking for is conversation around what the comic means, why it's so powerful, what it does, and what it might leave out. Because while Mouse has been an excellent entry point to the Holocaust education for some generations of Americans at this point, and while it's been the only graphic novel that some adults deign to read, it's not only that, it's also a specific work of art. But here's my confession. I'd never read part two of Mouse until I was preparing for our conversation today. You see, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My mom herself was born in a displaced persons camp. I read her copy of Mouse Part One, um, but I grew up learning about the Holocaust all the time. In second grade for Holocaust Remembrance Day, I volunteered to give a speech about my grandparents' experiences in front of the whole school. Obviously, this was the first sign I was going to grow up to be a podcaster. But this gives you a sense of what I grew up with. We watched documentaries, read books. We even went to a Holocaust survivor conference. I went to Jewish elementary school and summer programs, so I had in-depth historical formal education about the Holocaust at a child's level, maybe, but it's beyond what most adults ever hear. So anyway, what was Mouse going to tell me that I didn't already know and wasn't already full of rage about? And here's the thing. Mouse is also art. It's also a specific person's story. And that matters so much. And I'm so glad to finally have read the whole book and to be hosting this conversation now with our guests. I mean, the real reason this is happening is because my friend, Credit Gregory Silber, wrote a really excellent open letter to the school board in Tennessee. It's at Comics Beat. And it's really an excellent read. Like, just take a pause right now. Go and read his, go and read his piece. Um, I knew we had to feature him on the show along with the two esteemed guests that I get to know here through my professional non-comics life. Uh, and so we're going to get started. Joining me is Gregory Paul Silber, but you can call him Greg. He is a Brooklyn-based writer, editor, and critic specializing in comic books and pop culture. His work has appeared in outlets like Panel X Panel, Shelf Dust, Neo Text Review, The Daily Dot, and The Comics Beat, which is home to his weekly humor column, Silber Linings. He is also a comic book writer and freelance comics editor. He loves horror. Actually, in fact, Greg and I were on Progressively Horrified together recently to talk about Jewish horror movies. You should go listen to it. Uh, Rock concerts and thinking about that time, Joan Jett winked at him. Welcome to the show, Greg. Hey, Alana. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited we get to do this. It really is, like, to your credit to, like, make me recognize that I had to actually freaking do Mouse. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, well you, you know, I, I wasn't sure about, you know, I, I direct messaged you on Twitter and essentially invited myself on, yep. which I initially was like, oh, I know. But you had been saying that you wanted to have me on. And, you know, after publishing that open letter, I was like, this is probably the most Alana adjacent thing <laughs> uh, that I'm going to write. So maybe I should just give her a heads up. Thank you. No, I'm glad you pitched me. Um, this was perfect. Also joining me 
is Ethan Heitner. Ethan is a cartoonist who lives in New York City, among other things. Most recently, he helped edit the 51st issue of the radical political comics anthology World War III Illustrated, available now from AK Press, subtitled The World We Are Fighting For. Welcome to the show, Ethan. Hi. Is it possible that you might have been on my podcast in 2012 or something like that? No, but I have known you since 2003. Seven. I've known you for a long time, but I've never been I mean, on a podcast yeah. before. This is my first ever huh. podcast. Okay, I could have sworn, and I looked. I looked it up online, but no, I guess this is your first time. I'm glad we can have you joining us. Like, uh, yeah, we've known each other for a long time, and joining me uh, for the first time as well is Leo Ferguson. He is the director of strategic projects at Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. He's the founder of Jay Fridge's Jews of Color Caucus, lead organizer of the Jews of Color National Convening, and a lead author of Understanding Antisemitism. He is a graduate of the Grace Paley Organizing Fellowship, the Bend the Arc Selah Fellowship, uh, the Join Don't Kvetch Organized Masterclass, proudly Black and Jewish, a lifelong New Yorker, and a musician. Welcome to the show, Leo. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And it's good to know that even though I've I've known you for, for so much less time, but you've had me on so much sooner than Ethan, which says so much about <laughs> what a better quality of person I am. But. That sounds fair. No, I and you let me bully you on very quickly. I was like, yes, just messaged right. our group chat. And I'm like, please, I know some of you guys. And you're like, I, I'm like, you, you have to do this, Elio. So this is really great. Um, I want to thank you guys. And I, I want to open with the general question of, I guess we'll start with you, Leo. How did you first experience Mouse? That is a great question. Um, so I think it must have been in in either college or, or high school. Either one is possible. And, um, and I think my mother and I read it at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it was it was just totally absorbing and incredibly powerful. I mean, it's I, you know, I, I don't think I, I've actually don't think I'm I've read it since then. I'm embarrassed to say, but like, it's uh you know the like it's so vivid that um you know i can still picture specific panels and you know remember feeling so like um so blown away by how many different things it does both in terms of telling this historical story and the relationship between him and his father and the and then also like breaking the fourth wall and you know, having this kind of meta commentary on the limitations and, you know, possibilities of doing this in, in like cartoon form. It just uh, was uh, very striking. Had you read comics beforehand? Like, were you? Yeah, I was. I, yeah. yeah, I was a huge comics nerd. And I had already by, by the time I was in high school, I had already discovered like, you know, some of the weirder, you know, Vertigo and like Julie Doucette mm -hmm. and like people like that. And so I was, you know, um, I was like primed and ready for something like this. Right, right. Uh, what about you, Ethan? How did you first experience Mouse? Jeez, I don't know. I don't remember. I feel like it's been, I mean, I have a Swiss cheese for brain memory anyways, so I don't remember much of anything, but I feel like it's just always been part of my consciousness. I mean, I started reading comics real early and I got, like Leo, I was, you know, by high school, I was definitely reading like, quote unquote, serious comics. And I, I mean, I just, I feel like it was maybe on a bookshelf in my house or something. It's like, it's possible my parents would have picked it up. Um, but I've read it early and read it often. And uh, definitely have, I've sort of engaged with it a lot. And I did just reread it. I borrowed, I, I found out I did not actually have a copy in my house. And I had to borrow my downstairs neighbor's copy because I knew he had a copy. So I learned mm -hmm. it last night and reread it in preparation. Uh, my, uh, I, yeah, I didn't have a copy of Mouse with me because I'd read my mom's and she's not here. And I actually brought my neighbors. I, I, I vaguely remembered seeing it in her bookshelf while I was cat sitting. And I literally like randomly cold texted when like rather than asking about beats, I was like, I could have sworn I saw Mouse on your shelf. Can I please borrow it for a podcast? Wait, you don't. Um, but it the yeah. first thing you do when you meet one of your new neighbors or like come over to a friend's apartment for the first time, you don't immediately go to their bookshelf and look at what graphic novels they have on it. You know, actually that probably is true and would justify the fact that I was like, 
<laughs> can I borrow your book? No, I don't need to give you any beats. <laughs> yeah. Now that we can't judge people by their CD collections anymore, you know, because everything's online, you have to go with the graphic novel collection. This is true. This is true. Um, but basically, Ethan, like this is a book has just been part of like your awareness for so long, you don't even know where it came in. I, yeah, I don't remember exactly how old I was when I first read book one, but I do know it was my mom's copy. And it's also it's the only graphic novel she's ever owned, you know, and my, my, my mom, you know, was born in a displaced persons camp and her parents were survivors. And I asked her, actually, I was like, as, as a non-comics person, like when you found out that Mouse existed, were you at all uncomfortable about the fact that this was a graphic novel? And she's like, no, I was so excited. There was something that like the general public was excited to read. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, she got that immediately and didn't have the sort of format resistance that you sometimes hear Art Spiegelman talking about having met from other folks from, from her generation, you know, and older, um, about it. Uh, what about, what about you, Greg? I, I, I know your story of Mouse because your essay is wonderful, but for our listeners. Yeah, you thank you. Um, so for anyone who has read that essay, uh, thank you. Um, I am going to reiterate uh, the opening. Uh, I, I was not into comics, really, as a kid. Uh, I was very much into superheroes, which is a whole separate thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just one of those read everything he could get his hands on kids uh, so I would read the newspaper funnies, but, um, I was never like a comic book fan. I I'm not even sure how aware I was that comics were a thing, uh, for most of my childhood. And then when I was about 12, I, uh, so my grandparents, uh, both sets of my grandparents had this policy uh, basically where I could just pick up any book off the shelf, uh, when I visited their places and take it home with me and, you know, bring it back when I'm done. If, if you don't bring it back, you, you know, not a big deal. Um, and for whatever reason, I was in my uncle's old bedroom at my maternal grandparents' home, uh, which is actually where I'm recording this from now I'm visiting, and I, I feel like I found it in a really random place, like his closet. And uh, it was a copy of Mouse One, and it scared me. Like, like I mean, I, I knew what the swastika was uh, from learning about it in Hebrew school and whatnot. I don't know how much we learned about it in regular school at that time. Um, but it just kind of exuded this radiance of you should not be reading this. Um, me, a, you know, nice little 12 year old Jewish boy. Um, what I, I, I was scared. I didn't know what, it, it, you know, it, it's not just a swastika. It's a very sinister looking, uh, cat in the center of that design. And then there are, there's the image of, um, of two mice who represent the Jews huddled together with this tiny little blanket, uh, and it actually took me a few visits before I finally took the book with me and read it. Uh, there were a few visits where I would just kind of flip through and be like, oh my god, what is this? Uh, and then I read it and it absolutely changed my life. There is not a single work of literature in any medium um, that means more to me than Mouse. Uh mm -hmm. I, it, it was the comic that made me fall in love with comics, uh, in addition to being this comic that, while I don't, um, have any living Holocaust survivors in my family, uh, all four of my grandparents, uh, all four of my, uh, excuse me, all eight of my great grandparents, uh, came to the United States before, um, Hitler took power. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, obviously I have extended family who was in the camps and, uh, Mouse just humanized their story in a way that no other form of media or education ever did for me. 
Yeah, yeah. I, you know, you brought up something which I've been thinking about now, um, which is, you know, having a swastika on the cover of the book in the first place is probably a source of f- discomfort and like resistance that some people have to even picking up the book. Um, and it's interesting because we're sort of in this moment where, for example, like, at one point, we were telling a lot of folks were telling folks, like, can you like, stop putting like the 45 swastika logo on everything because it's actually kind of triggering i don't need to look at that every fucking day of my life um and like you sometimes are just don't want to be like in a swastika saturated visual environment because of what it triggers and i think like having the swastika on the cover of mouse and having it be stylized with the the hitler cat head death skull which is such a fucking genius graphic design um you know like that transgression was like really you know was really a big deal um and uh, absolutely what is one i'm sure one of the reasons that some people are drawn to or drawn away from looking at it and had to be uh no i was gonna say and and had to be edited uh, for German and I think other European translation editions because right. open displays of swastikas are not allowed. Like That's just like a free speech culture quirk cool. that is yeah. different in Europe. Which in yeah. some ways is an, an interesting, you know, it's like that's an interesting parallel for what just happened, uh, you know, in terms of the... Um, the clash of sensibilities and the, you know, the sort of bizarre idea of banning a story that is about this horrible evil because the symbology of the horrible evil or, you know, other, you know, elements of the story are too um, off-putting for, for people. It's such a strange, um, just like, you know, it's a, it's a mind, you know, mind twister in terms of the sort of bizarre sets of interests that are at play. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 funny you you bring this up um and and all of you make such great points i was actually i I wasn't even really thinking about it at first uh i i I was reading uh my copy of the complete mouse uh literally one of my most prized possessions because it's signed by and has a little sketch from art spiegelman um but i I was reading on the subway you know uh on my way here just uh you know brushing up before my, my appearance here and it took me a while to realize, oh my god, I'm reading a book with this giant swastika on the cover in public. Yeah. And I was kind of in my head preparing the speech I might have to make if anyone called me out. Like, no, it's actually this wonderful uh, book by, uh, by the son of Holocaust survivors. I'm Jewish. I am the yeah. furthest thing from a Nazi, I promise. Um, but I, I think that shock... And I'm sure this thing we'll get into later. That shock value is very necessary to what Mouse achieves. Mm-hmm. I mean, just on a symbolic level, turning the, seeing the, the the Hitler mustache, the push broom narrow push broom Hitler mustache, aligning with the uh, the what would be the nose hole of a skull. Um, the placing it where that would be on the face of a human, it's not, that's not where the nose hole would be located on the skull of a kitty, um, is, uh, it's just, this is just, and, and the, it's just a genius design. I, I, I don't know what has been more memorable than that. Um, you know, I, part of me wonders if one of those sort of resistances that I had to mouse was like, not liking to being symbolized with a mouse i don't know if that was connecting it to like the whole fievel thing from our childhood um uh or if i don't know i mean i i've i've always i've always loved cats and i don't know if i was just like i don't like being depicted as a mouse and if that might have been a resistance that i had to to the book on a certain level Um, and certainly like the problem wasn't having people be animals. And I certainly felt like that's genius, but 
I didn't know if I wanted to see myself that way. Um, and, and I love the way he connects it. I had for completely forgotten about the, um, the, the introduction where he quotes Hitler condemning Disney. If only Disney knew, since of course Disney loved Hitler, um, uh, about like for, for as Mickey Mouse being, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it wasn't Hitler who said this. It was a, a, a pro-Nazi newspaper article that was like condemning Mickey Mouse, connecting Mickey Mouse to Jews and telling people to wear the swastika is the like opening epic, epic, whatever. It's before the actual it's the opening of mouth too. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think like, I forget what the book word is for this, but whatever. Like that whole question is right in is, you know, like there is so many reasons for that decision. Yeah, um, I, so I, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm, go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, it, it's it's funny because I know there's been a, a lot of conversation uh, regarding th- that sort of symbology, and uh, a lot. You're f- certainly not the first person, uh, the first Jewish person uh, that I've heard express discomfort with uh, that particular choice of depiction. Uh, for me personally, though, it, you know, you know, I, it, it's it's such a subjective thing. I never really had an issue with it. Um, I, I knew about. I think. I think. I, I was old enough to know about the the way Jews were compared to vermin as a very old, you know, anti-Semitic mm-hmm. stereotype. Um, but part of the power of Mouse for me, even at such a young age, I think I was thirteen by the time I actually read it, was I immediately grasped what the symbols were. Jews, mice, you know, cats, Nazis, predators against the mice, um, and even the, the 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 fact that Americans were dogs. Um, that I I I later uh, just this week saw an interview with Art Spiegelman and his reasoning for um, for depicting the American characters as dogs was not what I assumed it was as a child, but but still it just. There's such an immediacy to the simplicity. What was the reason that he that he that he gave for it? So his reasoning was, uh, and, and his words, not mine. Uh, he said Americans are a mongrel society or, or mongrel country. He he used the word mongrel, which I don't know if that's <laughs> uh, considered <laughs> wow. a uh, politically okay. correct thing. But um, yeah. b- basically, his reasoning was that um, you know, same way dogs have mutts. Uh, America, America is a melting pot. Is a country of mutts, basically. That's a word I'm much more comfortable with. Um, uh, in fact, I, I, I mean, I I think know how def- that's that wild. That's really wild. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, there's this whole idea of like, you know, it's even in like Chag Gadia, like the the Jewish song, like of the dog overcoming the cat and the cat killing the mouse, etc. But I also saw it as like. You know, a dog going after a cat is not doing it to save a mouse. A dog is chasing a cat because dogs like to chase things. Um, and that it's just like, so it's not, it's not that it's about being the enemy of the cat per se. It's about this like exuberance and rambunctiousness, um, is sort of how I saw it. I don't know if, if Ethan, you yeah. want to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. I always saw it as just, the sort of like Americans are, are dumb and happy and, and like to slobber on things. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. I mean, it, you again, know, there's something it gets about ridiculous. Oh. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, like it, it gets ridiculous. I mean, he sort of puts a hat on it later in the, in the second volume, but the, yeah. you know, there's like the gypsy is a gypsy moth. And, you know, like should Francois Mouly be a frog? Like he knows it's like not, it's it's like a powerful visual, and he's a very, like, smart and capable cartoonist. But he also knows that you 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 can't if you start to think about it too much, it becomes ridiculous. Yes, but I love that Francois, his wife, who is con- who's originally French and converted to Judaism, is a mouse. Like that is so important, um, because converted people are real Jews. Like I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I was going to say that I think there's something about, you know, I think 
I mean, I think everyone, but certainly, you know, certainly Ashkenazi Jews have a very complicated relationship with, you know, power and um, powerlessness. And I think that, you know, the, the symbolism of, you know, the Jews as mice is such a, um, it's like, it's so hard to look that square in the face. I mean, that's, that's what I remember feeling like reading mm. it was just sort of looking square in the face at the absolute helplessness and having to come to terms with that, you know, and the, the idea, yeah. I think it's one of the yeah. things that's hardest to process about the Holocaust is it's so hard from the position that, you know, I grew up in as a, you know, relatively safe and, you know, free, <laughs> uh, you know, New Yorker and in, in the um, late 20th and early 21st century, right. To like, uh, comprehend that level of subjugation and mm-hmm. not wanting to admit that you can be in that position. And, uh, and I think that like, you know, the, the point that, uh, that I think, uh, you were making or the Greg was making about the imagery of, you know, like Jews as vermin that like part of, it seems like what's, you know, what he's saying there is like, you can make that true, right? It may not be mm. the truth about who we are, but you can manufacture that reality through enough brutality. And um, yeah. that's that's a really hard thing to look square at in the face at. I mean, I, yeah. I, I also do just want to like, like, it's a really powerful and, and important and well done book and he's a brilliant cartoonist. I do think there's a valid critique of it that like, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not the first person to say this, Definitely, it's a, it's a historical critique that's been made of the book that it, it does essentialize and it does, you know, sort of create this essentialization where Jews can only be mice and mice can only be victims of cats and Germans can only be cats and Poles can only be pigs. Um, you know, it, it, you know, I think politically, you know, like when you want to talk about the aesthetics of, of or, or the, the sort of political implications of, of artistic creation, it does create a narrative where it allows Jews to always see themselves as victims, which, like, shockingly, after the Holocaust, becomes a big part of how Zionism and sort of Jewish chauvinism integrates the the narrative of the Holocaust. It's like, oh, we're always the victims, therefore we get to do X, Y, Z. Therefore we are, you know, we have an excuse for, for you know, and, like, Jews are always victims. You know, it, it, it ties into that, or it doesn't challenge yeah. that, certainly. And... I just want to, you know, like, it's one of the engagements with that particular piece of Mouse, which is, you know, o- only one of many artistic choices that he makes that are, are pretty brilliant. I did a comic uh, 15 years ago now, by now, uh, about Israeli apartheid. And I sort of deliberately uh, made all the characters mice, both the Israelis and the Palestinians, because I, oh, I wanted to... Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I was actually reacting to Mouse as a as a, a sort of artistic provocation. I wanted to be like, no, like actually, these two sides are, are equally human or equally mice. I love that. Thank you. I I, I agree with, with that. It's a very valid critique. The essentialization of, of these symbols. Um, but one thing I would love to point out uh, that while it, it doesn't. Um, deter from the fact that, you know, that that is, uh, I don't know about flaw, because in some ways I think the simplicity is part of what gives the story its power, but certainly mm-hmm. a kind of chink in the armor. Um, the fact that there are these scenes where people, uh, with characters, I should say, are putting on masks to represent what who they are trying to appear as. You know, they're, they're part, you know, Vladek, uh, will try to appear German and he, he will be shown as a mouse with a cat mask. Yeah. Uh, the pig and then there's, the uh, later yeah. on, um, when it, it, it's one of the many super powerful self-reflective, uh, moments where it's just art in his studio drawing the story. And he appears in those scenes, as a human, a, a human man wearing a mouse mask. We never see his actual face. And then, you know, the reporters and, and the business people come in and, you know, their dogs and their cats. Um, 
So even though the simplicity is a flaw, I think he does interesting nuance with that simplicity. Oh, I think he's totally aware of what he's like. I mean, I think he, like, he's, he's a smart dude. He knows that there's limitations to it. It is a totally powerful artistic device. And he also knows that like, like he, he's playing with it and he's, he's self-aware. I mean. Yeah. Like we get the fact that we get to have those pages of him as himself with the mask on, and especially yeah, like, like you said, like talking with the therapist, I love the therapist character. I'm so glad he's included. Um, it's it's good to see a Holocaust survivor character in the book who is traumatized, but who is not dealing with it by being an asshole to people, frankly. Like, as, you know, I my, my grandparents were survivors and they had all kinds of problems, etc., but they were also sweethearts. And so, like, it was sort of funny because he's like, oh, I can't believe I'm, I'm doing my, I'm like, right, our, our art is saying this, like, he's like, am I playing into the stereotype about, like, the bitter Holocaust survivor? And I was like, you know, thinking of this as a kid, I'm like, that that's the stereotype? Like, I don't, is it? Like, I, there's so many times where people have to tell me something was a stereotype because I was unaware of something being a stereotype. Um, so I also appreciate, I appreciate the therapist one because like, it's another person for art to bounce ideas off of and share in memory, but it's also a different, a different kind of Holocaust survivor. Um, and I think that therapist session, I don't know, rereading it last night, I was really struck by that whole passage because I think he really gets something which is, to me, sort of very fundamental to the work, which is he says, like, you know, the therapist says to him, like, no, being a survivor doesn't make you a hero and 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 not being a survivor doesn't make you not a hero. Like, you know, these things happen to, and, and there isn't, there isn't a, like, moral quality that you get for being a survivor you're not ennobled by it. Like that passage to me just struck me as sort of like the the core of the book. And yeah. then there's also that brilliant bit where he quotes, you know, totally like, agree. you know, like, like saying anything about it is spoiling the, you know, but he's quoting it, not Brecht. Um, Samuel Beckett. Beckett, yeah. Every like, yeah. word is like an unnecessary stain on the silence and nothing in this. And yet I had to say, and yet he said it. And so, you know, Spiegelman is, I yep. think, again, there being self-aware. He's like, yeah, he knows and that's that's what every artist does like every artist is wrestling with that that no artistic creation is ever perfect it's never complete and yet we make it and we put it in the world i mean i think that's the that's what, one of the things that's so powerful about using the mice is that you're able to project all different kinds of people and faces and you know we know from interviews that a lot of holocaust survivors who did see the book saw it and said oh that's how it was that's what it was like and because of the the way the images are made into iconic representations rather than specific faces. Um, and, you know, like, and that, that actually helps people to connect to that. But by the same token, it's also why it's like, this can't be the only Holocaust. It's a problem that if like, when this becomes the only Holocaust book, but if they're good, I prefer this, to other books being the only Holocaust book kids get in the school, because at least this is about like fully human people and it has an understanding of that. And there's no Christian savior and like, it's, you know, rooted in individual person's reality at least, but like that, you know, there's no one way to talk about the Holocaust to, or to be a survivor or to, or to share those narratives. Absolutely. And just in a sort of perfect piece of symbolism, there's a train passing uh, by me right now. I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but there's there's some Holocaust imagery for you. Um, oh I, God! I, I, I was thinking Is that about what you the, think of uh, every time you get on the met- uh, every time you get on the subway? It's you not that kind of train. It's not that kind of train. It's a sure. That's what they said at first. <laughs> I hate you so much, so much. No. Every time you're okay. packed on a rush hour train, now I want you to just think about that. Actually, oh, can I just say, though, like, I found the scenes on the boxcar trains leaving Auschwitz to be the scariest shit in the entire book. Um, I remember like that. To have, go- to have gone through all of that and you're in the last stretch and then somehow it's actually the worst thing to be so yeah. close. Oh, yeah. And then they get like they get captured like they like the war is over and they just like this like free band of survivors just like runs into some fucking German soldiers and they get captured again and then they get yep. released and then it happens again. And you're like, holy shit. Like it just keeps going. And you, you're like, 
it, it, it would be too insane if it wasn't for the fact that it's it's real. It's a story. Yeah. That's. It, it, I feel like there's so many survivor stories like that. I even remember in J.G. Uh, Ballard's memoir, um, Empire of the Sun, that there's, you know, it's a, it's a similar thing where it's at the very end of the war and they're, you know, like moments away from freedom. And then, you know, obviously like awful things just keep on happening. And it's just such a horrible, horrible feeling, especially looking back, right, with history that you, you know how it's going to turn out. And so it makes your gut turn. I was I was thinking about the the um the mouse imagery more and and I was just thinking about and and the and you know the you know Ethan what you were saying about um that sense of victimization being such an important part of sort of contemporary Jewish like Ashkenazi Jewish psyche and that like um the I it made me think of another comic property um, of Black Panther and of the film. And I was just thinking about, you know, the, it's like, if the Holocaust is the original trauma plot for, for Jews, then thinking about, you know, all of the, you know, brutality of anti-Black racism and white supremacy and slavery and the way that in that it's, there's, there's this, it's a parallel I never thought about before, but like the idea of having a nation state, you know, a modern militarized nation state and the like choice that ends up then getting made at the end of the film, which is literally between essentially going the way of like leaning into that militarism and using the trauma as a justification for more violence versus, you know, um, choosing a different path. It's not, you know, it was just interesting. I never thought about that before. Um, the Can way that having a little bit i'm excited well just the idea that Zion, zionism is the enabling uh force that allows the like that trauma to then get transmuted into you know more violence and militarism in a way that like certainly ha- has never been true for you know african americans where by virtue of like being in the united states and being in this context we don't have the option of you know like there's there's still essentially like a pose of submission, right? Because we don't have the mm. option to um, to go that route, and I, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, or whether it's like a necessary historical phase that you have to pass through after a trauma, I don't know. But it's just interesting to think about. Oh, I totally thought that we were about to have a conversation about the death of um, Michael D. Jordan's character in the Black Panther movie. Um, so I'm like, but, um, and, and, and his talk, his speech about wanting to be connected to those who died in the middle passage, basically. I have a question for you guys. Um, cause my partner asked me this and I actually didn't know the answer. And I was surprised that I did not know the answer, which is, are there any other like at length serious depictions of like Auschwitz in comic book form? Yes. Um, but there, oh, there's a couple of things. You have recent comics that have attempted to show Magneto's story. Okay, yeah, no, I don't, I don't mean in a superhero comic. I'm sorry, I, I'm going oh. to lay my bias down. I'm, and I, I realized we were just, you know, like uh, chatting with each other about the X Men stuff. And as an X Men, I'm like superhero nerd uh, initially. I, but I, I mean, actually, people trying to depict the Holocaust or camps or Auschwitz as a piece of like sort of, sorry to just use the shorthand, but like as a piece of serious uh, comic book art, Ilana, not. I wouldn't be the one to ask then actually. Um, But I don't, I don't really think so. I feel like people don't want to, people just don't want to compete. Like it's the last word, even though that's not his intent really. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but. Berlin uh, never gets to the camps, right? It stops before, before that, the Jason Lutz book, I never finished Berlin, I have to admit. I also just remembered in thinking about this that there is actually one other very explicit Auschwitz death camp comic, if you can call it that, which I don't know if anybody else has seen. I don't know if you guys know Dave Sim from the Cerebus mm-hmm. cartoons. He's I do. like fucking fuck uh, in the head. <laughs> um, and he did a comic, uh, I wouldn't say about maybe 10 years ago, called Judenhaus which is literally just, um, I mean, it's a really interesting, if you want to talk about how to, depictions of the comic, uh, depictions of the Holocaust in comics form, it's a really interesting contrast to Mouse. 
because it is it's thin and it is literally just him doing he's really into this thing of like um photorealistic black and white pen drawing so it's all just him copying photographs from the camps in meticulous black and white ink line work with lots of like very fine hatching and then each panel is like has text of actual anti-semitic texts from like world history and it's just that for about i want to say like maybe like 40 or 50 pages and it's on the one hand like extremely brutal like it's extremely like 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 just to see page after page after page of like these actually very photorealistic depictions of what you know the sort of skeleton like living survivors of the camps all those things the conditions they were in but it's not a story it's not a narrative yeah it's this very sort of like um i don't know it's it's it does something very different from what mouse is doing and i don't know if it's in any way near as hmm. effective i don't i hate judging art as effective or not effective <laughs> well but. yeah I, I, you know, I mean, at my at the JCC that I grew up going to all my arts classes and programs at, we had, you know, really detailed pencil sketches of Holocaust scenes along the walls that you'd go into in between the different art workshops and where you'd go and like learn painting. Um, so certainly like surrounded with really detailed imagery from that. But I, I, I want to point to something which Art pointed to himself as a really important comic of significance in his childhood, which was The Master Race by Bernie Craigstein and Al Feldstein, which was an EC, com- EC horror comics, single issue, um, you know, story that came out that is about uh, like a commandant at like from the Nazis, and he's successfully been hiding in plain sight. And then he finally meets justice. And there's, um, there are scenes in that of um of of Auschwitz, but not a ton of it. And there's um but there's lots of stuff of like Nazis doing propaganda and partying and just being despicable. Um and it's I haven't like reread it, but like my but I have read it as an adult and I did think it was really great actually and impressive and cool that this was something that was published in nineteen fifty five, you know? Um but I do want to get back to what I was saying before, though, about it being in the more some of the more recent comics, recent ish comics about Magneto and his origin story as a Holocaust survivor, which is like they weren't allowed to be explicit about that as being part of his origins in the beginning of the Claremont era, you know, in the seventies, because this is all retcon stuff this you know the initial character wasn't designed to be that uh, but it's an interesting direction that they pivoted it but even when claremont wanted to introduce that aspect of the character into the story he wasn't really allowed to talk about it straight out straight ahead for some years um i honestly think that mouse and the popularity helped make people the publishers accept that it was acceptable to talk about the holocaust in a comic so it enabled those stories to also be part of, you know, the the superhero stories and the superhero narratives as well. Um, I think it opened it up for that. I mean, I, I hear that, but part of my initial objection to letting you talk on your own podcast about Magneto, um, mm-hmm. like part of my visceral, like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not what I meant, is because I actually find that, like, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but... And I'm curious what Greg and Leo have to say about it or what you have to say. I find that kind of a banalization. Like I find like the first, that first X-Men movie that has that scene of Magneto in the camps. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's frankly like fucking ridiculous and like stupid. And I'm I'm sorry if other people find it moving. Like I, I, this is totally my subjective hot take. Goes without saying. But I find that really fucking stupid and kind of an insulting way to use the Holocaust because it's like, yeah, well, if we had superpowers, then it wouldn't be a fucking problem. Like, then, like, you know, like, if, if, I don't know, it's just like, to me, that, it, 
yeah, the, the the word that just comes back to me is, is banalization, and I'm curious what you guys. Well, think I've that. there's been there's been enough done now that I can say that some of it is bad and some of it isn't. Like it all depends on whether the person writing it and the person drawing it are idiots or not. And we've had sure. a range. Sure, that we've sense. had a and, range. And just because we have superpowers, I mean, they might have the Ark of the Covenant. So you know, it would be a fair fight. I don't know. I don't think it. But I hear you. I actually haven't rewatched the first X-Men movie in like a million years, so I don't even uh, know anymore. But well, um That first X-Men movie, I, I mean, I liked it a lot because I was the perfect age to watch it. Uh, and I saw it on, on like VHS or something when I was 10. Um, but it was kind of a long road to get to a point of liking it uh, from that first scene because... I, I, I was scared, first of all, because, I, 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 I mean, I, at that point, only knew X-Men from the cartoons. Uh, I was not reading comics yet. I had no idea why this X-Men movie was starting with a Holocaust scene. And also, I was watching a sleepover with my dumb 10-year-old friends, and they're all, oh, wow. yeah. like, being jerks about it. And I think I, I was the only Jewish one there, and, like, I didn't even know how to articulate, like, this is not appropriate guys. Like you shouldn't be. Yeah. But, um, even looking back now as an adult, I am besides this kind of where I was as a kid. Um, I, I really, uh, Magneto is probably my favorite, just comic book villain period for reasons that if I go off too far on, we'll have a whole nother podcast. But I like the fact that he is a Holocaust survivor just as a general thing. But I do. I, I am with you. A lot, a lot of the characterization, a lot of the versions of that characterization have not been good, especially in the X Men movies, which overall have not been good. Um, I, I I I look back at that first scene as being very. Uh, uh, banalization certainly seems appropriate. Also, it, it just feels mm-hmm. weirdly exploitative there's no reason for there for it to be there other than to be like you thought this was a comic book movie but you know we're showing you this intense holocaust scene this is for grown-ups um mm-hmm. but but even later on it, it, it just this and so many other things where uh in pop culture the holocaust is depicted it just feels like oh the, the, you know the, this isn't portrayed with an actual understanding of how Jews experience these things. Right, right, right. I mean, that's the thing that is important with Mouse is that this is a memoir. And this is, you know, apparently when it was first released, sometimes it was getting categorized in fiction sections because it was art, you know? And and, and art had, and Art Spiegelman had to, like, fight to be like, you cannot fucking put my memoir yeah. in the fiction section. Just I refuse to call it a graphic novel for that reason, actually. Um, I understand that it's a, a useful term. Graphic memoir? Or, right, exactly. It's a graphic I, memoir. I call it a graphic memoir. Yeah. I, on this yeah. Important, important controversy, I stand proudly with fellow cartoonists in saying they're goddamn comic books. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah. it's nonfiction. The problem, yeah. the, the, the thing a, we're arguing over isn't whether or not it's a comic, it's whether or not you should call it fiction or regarded as nonfiction. Um, and, and I think that that is um, one of the things that like having it represented as mice also can bring is that like, it, it is, it is a story that people can read the specifics of faces and people that, that they feel into it without having it to be wed to a very specific look of a particular person. Um, you know, there's definitely an excess of, really shitty media that either like uses the Holocaust in cynical ways or crafts the entire experience as a redemption story for the Goyam. And like, that's one of the reasons why we know that, you know, some, a lot of people are less comfortable with mouse is because there isn't a, a, like a, a, like a Christian savior who comes in and helps everybody. Um, like that's why there are, makes them so uncomfortable. You know, say, or as a redemption story for Jews. No, but it's not either. It's it's so um, it's it's interesting. Like the the 
you know, it's, I feel like it's one of these things where depicting them as animals makes it more real and makes it easier to connect to in a weird way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all have that same experience, but there's just something about like, I I don't know whether it's just desensitization or whatever it is, but there's something, I mean, almost like black and white photos feeling more real than color ones, right? It's like the, 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 um, the emotions that I can feel sometimes watching like an animal, you know, like I can watch violent movies all day long, but I can't watch Bambi, you know what I mean? Because it's too... Oh, yeah, no, exactly. Or I think like Pride of Baghdad, for example, is another, like that hit me so hard when I read it. And, you know, I've read everything about the war in Iraq and, you know, whatever, but somehow that's the thing that gets under my skin. So it's... Well, that's... Yeah. I I mean, I just wanted to say something about that. That's, I mean, I, I really... I really want to talk about Mouse as a artistic production, and like despite the fact that it's nonfiction, it is also. I mean, he even highlights that he's an unreliable narrator. But to me, also part of it is, it's it's the animals thing, but it's also just the way he draws it, which is in a very yes. simple black and white pen style, which you know. And Leo, you and I have have talked about this, and. Uh, I respond really strongly to black and white comics that show that they are the drawing of a single hand. And to me, that's part of, mm. I think that's part of part of Mouse's power and part of Spiegelman's power as a, as a cartoonist is that I find sort of uh, attempts to be, you know, like the sort of like high, high production value, uh, glossy comics, which, you know, are a lot of like superhero and sci-fi fair to me. I have a hard time accessing them because I really, to, it, I'm not, this is, somebody else said this once, but like uh, cartooning is almost like handwriting when it's coming straight from a cartoonist down onto paper. It's like, it's it's such a part of their being as an artist and it's it operates at a level of abstract, abstraction where it approaches something almost like writing where so much of it is taking place in your head and and Spiegelman's drawings are so direct in that way and you can see his hand and the scratches where he's scratching it away at stuff and the white out and the ink mm-hmm. and to me that that gives it its own vitality and life in this you know in the way that you know it looks like a, a george harriman car, uh sort of it does it like, does look like crazy cat it does look like yeah. crazy cat a bit yeah and it's like these, these characters oh, just another yeah. Give the yeah, these characters have their own life. They don't. They don't. They're they're not dead on the page. I don't know. Again, purely subjective. No, his art style and his paneling is all really excellent. Um, and you know, he when he is able to really do diagrams of spaces to bring you in them. I love the scene where he and his dad are debating whether or not there was an orchestra that was playing of the uh, of the uh, survivors of Auschwitz because like you know he had read a historic record that there had been and his dad didn't remember that so then they see two different versions of this story happening I mean you know like comics they're able to deal with that ambiguity in a way that a lot of other medium can't really capture at all either like you know those moments where he like pulls back and shows you like the hanging bodies or something and like it takes up almost a full page and you're like oh fuck you know like he's yeah. good he's good at what he does that being one of the main objections by the people who uh, who banned it. Yeah. Those images of the hanging bodies. I, and you can see how much of, you know, he has other styles, like, because you actually get an excerpt from Prisoner on the Hell Planet, which is an earlier comic that he'd done about his mother's suicide, is in, for an indie, like, underground comics publication. Comics with an X, as we say. Um, that's drawn... In a completely different style, it looks like it was like um, linoleum matching or something like that in here, um, and it has a lot of expressionism. Yeah, I mean, have you guys seen a lot of his other comics? Like he's, he's kind yes. of does all sorts uh, of shit with comics. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm re- I'm really glad that uh, Ethan that you brought up the simplicity that he brings to Mouse here because. Yeah, if you look at his other work, most of it is it does not look like Mouse. Uh, and one of the I, I just went on this YouTube hole watching like twenty five plus year old interviews with Art Spiegelman, 
And one of the things he, he talked about was that he wanted, you know, you, you, you said that his cartooning style here is like handwriting, and he actually used that term. He wanted his his art and his lettering, actually, to look like handwriting uh, for Mouse. And the simplicity that he brings to, to the figure drawing in particular, I think is that's something I paid a, a particular attention to in my rereading because... I, I think that it's the lack of specificity that, kind of, as you mentioned, does almost make it more human. You, you only see a little bit to, to differentiate the characters from one another, like the clothes they wear. But ultimately, I, I, in their faces, they're all just mice. It's, it's hard to, and even real life, it's hard to tell one mouse apart from another. Um, and so you're paying more attention to what they're saying and their their body language at certain points. And it, it, it just, it, for so many other cartoonists, it, it would be a mess. It would be a disaster, but it just becomes so powerful here. And the other thing I want to bring up in regards to the art, I, I'm, now that we're talking about Prisoner on the Hell Planet, I mean, that to me... I mean, to this day, but but also as as a kid, that is the most powerful part of the, the book for me because in context, mm. what it does, and this just kind of brings us to a larger point here. For me, one of the most haunting themes of Mouse is this idea that the the pain does not end just because Auschwitz has been liberated. Or, right. you know, you move to America. And that, you, you know, we've talked about how that, that, you know, so many of the themes of Mouse are very difficult for, uh, for, for, for non-Jews and particularly Christians to, to comprehend. And this idea that, you know, for better or worse, life goes on. And sometimes for the worse. You know, and, and his mother committed suicide because she could not handle the pain that she still carried. And, it, you know, it, and Art Spiegelman inherited all that pain that she had, too. It, it's a difficult thing to talk about and say out loud, but it, it's such a necessary thing of what Mouse says, which is, you know, people... The, the, the survivors were not... They didn't survive because they were heroes. The people who died didn't die because they were martyrs. It just, it's life. And, and sometimes it's random. And, you know, good things often come out of it. You meet good people along the way. But, but there, there's just, what happens, happens. And there's only so much you can do to control it. It's, what's interesting, though, is like, you know, so much of, my own understanding of the Holocaust, you know, comes from my experience with my with my grandma and my grandpa. And the, you know, there are a lot of Holocaust survivors who like, didn't want to talk about their stories or share them. And and something I've been really thinking about as I've been reading this and preparing for this episode is that even though I feel like my grandparents talked about this stuff all the time, they actually only spoke about a handful of specific stories. And that house handful of specific stories came up all the time. And those handful of specific stories in many ways are ones where you like really see sort of who they are um, and what they are. Um, and like you, I, you like you can see in my, in my grandmother's obsession with constantly cleaning everything at all times um, like, yeah, that, and like, she will connect that, like she would, she would connect that to how she was able to survive. And so it's like, we're all like, oh, well, you're not supposed to connect people's behaviors to outcomes, but it's like, and you're not, but like, that's not how people rationalize themselves or their own lives. Um, things are random, but then they see these specific stories as being illustrative of what they did or what happened. Uh, and, and I also was really aware how different, the way um, Vladek, his uh, art's dad, talks about his own experience of the Holocaust is very much just like, he, you know, he's willing to talk about every piece of it um, that his son is making him. You know, he doesn't want to. He's not just putting out there with the stories. But like, 
you know, in, in the stories that my grandparents share, they're much more, it's like the Hollywood, that's not, I'm going to say it's the Hollywood story of like things that they happened or did, but it is like the one in which they are a protagonist that has, that is doing things and taking actions that contributes to the outcome and control of their own lives. Well, I can tell you, speaking of Hollywoodization, I know uh, Art Spiegelman is um, very much not a fan of the movie Life is Beautiful. Oh, God, I was so offended. I could not believe that people were talking about watching it. Like, I wasn't even that old, and I knew that that was offensive as fuck. Yeah, I, um, we watched it in my eighth grade, I guess, English class after we read Night. And I felt like a crazy person because, because, like, I, 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 I wasn't aware that there was this larger discourse going on at the time. I just was like, sure. just fundamentally, I, I felt very strange that, like, like I, I, that, that here was this movie where the, the message seems to be, here's a guy who survived because he had a great attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, nobody and, that or wants that. And uh, I, 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 I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, Art Spiegelman repeats himself a lot if you watch enough interviews with him, as I do. <laughs> I mean, I'll keep watching him. I love the guy. But he, uh, he mentioned that at, at the time that Mouse was coming out, you know, people still were kind of wary about, you know, portraying the Holocaust in the media. And, he, and one of the quotes he often says is, now it seems like the, uh, there's, a, there's an Academy Award for Best Holocaust Movie every year. Yeah. It's fucking and cheap. I, I am certainly not saying that there shouldn't be, um, you, you know, th- that we should, so, for whatever reason, stop making Holocaust media. But I, I, I do think that he is saying something that very few people are, are willing to talk about, which is that, yes, like, just because it, it doesn't outwardly seem anti-Semitic to portray this Jewish character uh, as a hero in the Holocaust, you're really not fundamentally grasping what that meant for the people who were there. Yeah. But I, I just think it's really interesting to me, like, this contrast between, like, the nihilistic, I get, I don't know if it's nihilistic, but it could certainly be read as nihilistic, like, way of looking at the situation versus like, you know, having grown up in an experience where our people were telling these stories all the time, but the only way they can tell them is by telling them in which they are protagonists because it's like, it's just too terrible to talk about it any other way. Well, even with mouse, I I mean, it frustrates me, you know, the way I'm I'm not saying he was a bad person. I mean, he certainly had very serious character flaws, but Vladek Spielman, you know, people talk about, oh, he, he's he's one of the, the great heroes of American literature. Wait, or, what? Who and said that? It, uh, oh, one, one of the interviews I believe you, but that, like, that I saw with Art Spiegelman, uh, very well, well-meaning uh, television host. But wow. even like, this is going to sound insane, uh, you know, early on in, you know, my... Uh, comics reading you know i'd read all the listicles like you know 100 greatest comic book heroes and like ign or something you know 10 years ago or whatever put vladek spiegelman at at, like somewhere within the top 10 great comic book heroes and it's like man you are really missing the point yeah and and, and it's something i really paid attention to in, in my latest free reading where art spiegelman doesn't condemn his father, but he doesn't explicitly praise him either. Um, he just, he's the man that he had to be at yes. that time in his life to survive. Yes. I think that's a great yeah. way to express it. And it's, you know, it's that like human impulse to like make meaning, which like then betrays us right in this context where, looking for a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end and a moral, you know, becomes, um, you know, like there's no, (laughs) there's no moral to the Holocaust. There's no, you know, meaning that you can make of it that fits into that need of a package. And, um, but, and, and, and yet, you know, I, 
also when you get to the end, I don't know, I got just having reread the whole thing last night mm-hmm. before bedtime, with that end panel where he says, good night, Rishu, I'm tired now. I'm like, it's so, like, he's so, uh, I don't know. It, I mean, it, it, like, it's nihilistic or, or it doesn't have meaning, but it is also full of humanity in, in the positive sense of just like, even this, you know, hurt, difficult, wounded old man, like, you feel for him and you. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, How could you? I mean, no, you, I mean, I, it, for yeah. me, mm-hmm. no, no, go ahead. I mean, for, for me, one of the things is like, he sounds, his personality might, sound nothing at all like my grandparents but his uh way of speaking is exactly my grandparents are also from poland um and like all of the wording of the way the grammar of sentences plays out which is a very specific grammar of people who you know grew up speaking yiddish as their first language uh it's just like this is this is just like listening to my grandparents so i you know i'm i'm always like I'm as much as I'm like, oh my God, please stop treating your wife like shit and please stop being a racist. Like, and I, the way he words things, it just gets me in my heart. And I am curious for, for those of you who don't, who didn't have little adorable, you know, native Yiddish speaking, heavily accented grandparents, if you also have that sort of like, Oh, it's my my grandpa. I want to like give him like a little hug and kiss, even though he's also just did all these terrible, you know. Even though even though he's like just totally berating his son and his wife and like all that. Well, th- there are moments of real charm in between all the j- just insufferability. I I I love that part where. Um, you know, after he's done uh, his interviewing for for the night, uh, Art goes out and is trying to find his coat, and he finds out that uh, Vladek threw it out. And he's yes. like, well, why would you throw out my coat? And Vladek's like, oh, it was so so old, you know, take mine. Uh, and he's like, no, it's too big. And he's like, no, on you, it looks like a million bucks. It It's, uh, well, uh, my grandparents uh, are... Uh, first generation Americans. Um, I know my great grandparents uh, w- uh, just from old videos and stuff. Many of them did talk like that, um, and I, I, I just I even though I, I didn't know my great grandparents very well, I do read these scenes and it, it is a little bit of a way. Like, yeah, you, you know, not not that my grandparents uh, my great grandparents shared all of Vladek's traits certainly uh being that that they were not holocaust survivors um it, it just it does feel very quintessentially i don't know old ashkenazi old jewish person yeah i just yes oh my i made too fast our walking i'm like i want to read <laughs> everything in exact pronunciation of my grandparents sorry yeah leo go ahead <laughs> absolutely no no i was well i was gonna change the subject a little um but like just speaking of making meaning of things i just am so curious to get y'all's take on our friends in the tennessee board of education and i like i feel like i have been struggling to try to figure out how to make meaning out of this story because Hmm. you know my immediate impulse was to think about critical race theory and, you know, the rise of fascism in the United States and, you know, all that. And then, you know, when you dig into the story a little more, it's like, it sounds just like stupid, you know, prurient, like they didn't like the curse words and the fact that there was a teeny bit of sex and, and, but then also that they thought that the violent imagery was, you know, it's going to be scarring for young people. And it just like, I can't figure out whether this is a story about, um, about, you know, the rise of Trumpism and, you know, another front in the culture war, or whether this is a story about some stupid uptight people on, you know, board of education who are just dumb as rocks, or whether this is a story about, you know, 
what what kind of heart you know when and how you expose young people to the horrors and reality of the world or uh mm. you know and so yeah i've just i'm i'm like tell me somebody tell me what to think <laughs> yeah i mean something I, I i well first of all as a uh Progressive in the United States, I, I I constantly have to play this game when I look at the news of are they evil or just uh, are they evil and playing dumb or are they actually the, that dumb? Um, right. And something I've been really struggling with because I, I, when when this I first read about this, uh, my first draft of my open letter to the McMinn County School District. Uh, I, I outwardly was just like, you are racist and you are fascist. And I, uh, with, with, with the help of my uh, editor, the, the wonderful uh, uh, Heidi McDonald, as well as managing editor Joe Grunewald, but it was Heidi who was like, you make some really good points here, but, you know, it, for the sake of argument, you might <laughs> you might not want to come right out and call, you know, label them as such. And I was like, okay, I will say that their actions are anti-Semitic and fascist because yeah. from an objective standpoint, they are. I don't know their hearts. I don't know these people. I don't have high hopes for, um, for, 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 for them, but, you know, maybe they just truly do not know what they are doing here and what they are saying. And I, I look at something like, like I think I, I, the part that might have made me the most mad when you read the minutes of that meeting, uh, where, where they're talking about the nudity in the book. And the nudity they're talking about, they're not talking about the scene in the, uh, the camps when, when, when the men are uh, coming out of the showers and they're thrown th their shoddy uh, prison clothes they objected to the scene of the quote unquote naked woman. And the only instance of that in mouth is when Vladek during uh, the prisoner prisoner on the hell planet section, Vladek walks in on his wife, Nadia, uh, sorry, not Nadia, uh, Anya after she has slit her <laughs> wrists in the yeah. bathtub. And how on earth do you look at that scene and be like, oh man, well, you know, some thirteen-year-old boys might find that titillating. So, what is wrong with you? Yeah, it's fully deranged, and I think that that speaks to what it really is. I think that, and I think that that in that it reveals that what that what itself, right? Because they're not, yeah, they're not actually worried about kids being traumatized, which of course would still not be okay. Because sorry, like. You don't get no, to hide your children. The Holocaust is traumatized. The shit that your grandparents did to me. <laughs> like, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, like, it's not even that genuine thing because the idea that some kid is going to wank to uh, very flatly drawn, slightly off center breast of a dead woman is just preposterous. Yeah. That and, uh, and it was the same guy who brought this up, Tony Allman. Uh, so, so I published the open letter, but also uh, they have a portal where you could send uh, messages to members of the Board of Ed. And they you can't just send it to the whole Board of Ed. You have to choose the members. Oh, so I chose Tony Allman very deliberately. Uh, he's also the guy who went out of his way to be like, oh, it, Art Spiegelman, didn't that guy used to do graphics for Playboy? Yeah, it's like, well, I, I guess you'd know since you're the one who's obsessed with this now. Um, and the garbage pail kids. So, you know, it's a real trap. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you certainly can't let it and wacky packages. children then. Oh, my wacky God. packages, too. I mean, I'm going to perhaps uh, be, this is not like probably the correct thing to say, but I honestly don't fucking care about it, right or or just like it's not that I don't care about it. I know it's bad, but I'm actually not trying not to engage with that stuff as much as possible. I mean, like Greg, your your piece was very beautifully and strongly written, and I think you sort of said everything that needs to be said on it in a sense. And and also, I'm just like, like I don't have any like in my in my hat as an organizer or as a political politically engaged person. 
I have zero context or engagement with these people. I have no fucking like contact for them. I don't know what their political or like material reality is. And it's like nothing I can say can or will be helpful to anybody who's engaged with any sort of struggle with them. Like if I was, you know, like if they were a person who I ha- who was a part of my life and I had to engage with them, then I would engage with them. If they were part of my like community and I, you know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm just like putting my head down and like staying out of trouble. But like if, if there was a meaningful connection from me to them in any way, then I would have an avenue of engagement, but I, I just don't see it. So I actually, uh, like, I just like, I, I don't know what to say to, you know, like, and, and, and I think it's, I also think it's okay for people to not know what to say to these things, right? Like the, in, in these like moments of outrage that, that's, that fly up, like, I think it's okay to be like, oh, that actually is like, it's not actually like we're, we're connected via media, but we're, they're not actually part of a, 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 like, I'm not an interlocutor for them and they're not for me. And so I don't really know what I, like how meaningful it would be for me to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it's helpful. a I mean, it's, response. Y- yeah, totally. I mean, it's, I think it's like, if, if we weren't in this moment where, there really is rising fascism in the United States. And there really is this, you know, naked, uh, you know, like truly naked racism in a way that we haven't seen in a minute. Um, And, you know, all of these other, you know, forces that I think that's the thing is that it makes it hard to figure out whether this is something that, you know, is some, you know, whether this is part of a larger story about anti-Semitism and white supremacy and therefore requires deep engagement and paying a lot of attention, uh, or whether this is, well, I mean, you know, Leo, to be fair, like if it's part of a larger story about anti-Semitism and and deep engagement, that's your job. That's not mine. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) Maybe that's why I'm worried about it. But like, no, but I think that's one of the things that's really good about Greg's piece is that it does create space in it so that if these people are just that dumb, they can take from his piece and learn and understand things differently. Or if they're just straight up anti-Semites motivated by pure evil, then, you know, what have you. But like, I, yeah. I, I think Greg's piece does a really good job of allowing space for for the well, possibility that they just are fucking well, dumb. Th- th- yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and. <laughs> I, I I do want to say too. Um, well, it's it's a couple of things because I, I first of all look. I mean, I'll I'll be real. I would have published it as an open letter if uh, if they were my only or even primary uh, intended audience. Um, and right. uh, I'm 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 sure you guys saw parts where like you know if I was only trying to convince them. I might not have made certain points about, say, the larger trend of, you know, banning books about race and banning books about queerness. Um, and, you know, the, the, a lot of people, because uh, I've, I've gotten more responses to this that, than maybe anything I've ever written. Um, and a, a few people have made the point, not, none of you, but it, a, a few people have, have brought up like, well, why ha- uh, aren't you saying X, Y, Z about, you know, all the bannings about books on race or all these other things. And I do in the, uh, in the letter address the fact that this is one microcosm of a much larger trend. And I should also say I'm opposed to pretty much all cases of uh, book censorship. I, I'd be, I'd be, upset if they were if you know if if this were a book about uh the armenian genocide i i would absolutely still be furious it just this is a case where me as a american jew and as someone for whom mouse like i said at, at the top of the show the most important book in the world to me it was just a real case of okay you just made it personal and so, in, in you know, in my capacity as someone who has is able to speak specifically on this, I, I saw it as an opportunity to make a larger point 
about the, this trend where anything that reminds, you know, white Christian straight people uh, that the, the history of that in America is not uh, super rosy. You know, this, this is a large trend, and this is just one example of it. I really do hope people realize this is just this isn't just one school. This isn't just yeah. one district about one book. Um, and we certainly shouldn't be spending all our energy talking about just the McMinn County School District about mouse. This is happening all over the country. And by the way, not just in the South, too. That's another thing that's involved. Right, I've gotten a right. lot of responses like, oh, well, what do you expect? It's Tennessee. Okay, but this is happening in, like, Maine, too. Including Spiegelman himself has been, has sort of had that reaction, which is kind of annoying. I mean, you know, there's there's another direction you could take this. And I think, you know, uh, uh, Karl Marx, bless you both for the work, Greg and Leo and Alana, that you're all doing as sort of publicly facing people with platforms. And there's, you know, there's a whole other conversation about Spiegelman and free speech fights and, you know, oh, like yeah. him, like him as a figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and like, it's just, I'm not going to talk about the Harper's letter, but seriously, fuck that. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I one, one thing I want to I want to bring back, though, just to talk about because I do want to sort of wrap up talking about the book as 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 itself a little bit is. It's a book that sort of tells the story of itself in a lot of different ways. Um, I like in the format of the interviews that he's doing with his father and this conversation with his therapist. And at one moment that really stuck with me is um, uh, Vladik, uh, he's talking about working, disassembling Auschwitz camp machinery. Uh, before the Russians came, and there's a man who he's working with who had been more involved in the crematoriums and like more involved in like the gas chambers and stuff, which you know Vladik hadn't really worked in that part of the concentration camp. Um, and uh, the man kept t- telling him like, "This is how this works," and then the bodies would do this, and then they would do this to these people. And Vladik is saying, "Why? Why? Why are you telling me this? Like you." Like, I, I don't need you to tell me this. This is like, and the guy just keeps telling him anyway, because he needs to. And so it's amazing seeing like somebody who is living, who is in the Holocaust, himself still in Auschwitz and himself still months away from being free. Um, and he's already like having this like response to somebody who saw something more graphically than he did and saying like, why are you telling me this? Well, I think Jews those just, scenes... Jews just can't stop talking. That's that's the we. Thing. That's also true. We <laughs> cannot stop talking. Like nothing. Well, like like it is. We will not stop talking. We will not stop telling you about the traumatic, disgusting, upsetting, whatever thing it is, or wonderful, beautiful, or like that we just had sex and how great it was. Like we do not stop talking. <laughs> like it will not be. You know what? I mean? Like there's no there's no censorship. It's constant, well, and that's what happens. But yes, <laughs> I think those scenes of of Vladik. You know, t- telling the, 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 these other uh, other prisoners and whatnot that you know he doesn't want to hear it. They actually juxtapose really interestingly with something that I don't think I ever noticed before this most recent reading that I did this week, which is that in the scenes in what was then the present day, you know, roughly the uh, late seventies and early eighties, where uh, Art is interviewing Vladek, and you know, their relationship is so fraught. I, I mean, Vladek j- just is such a tense, difficult person to be around. And there are all these scenes where, like, say, Vladek is complaining about his wife, Mala, and Art frequently throughout the book changes the subject to be like, okay, so but so you're telling me that you were uh, going into Auschwitz. Like, he changes the subject to the from the mundane to the thing that you would think would be way more difficult to hear to uh, hear about, and I I I don't know I, I don't really have a grander point to make about that other than it's just a, such a fascinating thing to see play out. I mean I think but I think like beyond the whole like it's true like Jews will not stop talking thing like I I think him show him showing that people are going to need to tell the story because it needs to be told is just an illustration of like the purpose of the book that's contained within the book. And that that's something which happens throughout the book 
so many times. Um, but, but it's presented in, what I'm saying is it's presented in this way where it's like, it's so much harder for art as a son. It's so much harder mm-hmm. for him to hear about his father complain about his present, you know, marital troubles. It's easier for him to hear about his past trauma as a Holocaust survivor. Right. 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 Well, I mean, that, that also speaks a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a reality of being an artist where you're like, when you have an artistic project and you're sort of like doing the research for it, like you do exploit the personal traumas around you, you know, like you do like, that's, that's, that's part of what his work is doing. He's, you know, this is his, he knows he's making this comic book. He knows he's, you know, he's not just having a casual conversation with his dad. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of the ugly truth of, of, producing art is that you you mind the the tragedy and the trauma around you to turn it into something um i mean i just wanted you know i wanted to my final thought on it would be you know regardless of my disinterest in engaging in the sort of broader political implications of this moment i do think it is really good for more people to be reading mouse because it is Mm -hmm. you know i you know i you know, in my personal trajectory about mouse, it's interesting because I definitely went through a period where I was like, ah, it's sort of overrated. It's like the one book that everyone knows. It's like the mm-hmm. like I sort of lost interest in it for a long time. And and coming back to it later and being like, oh no, there's a reason why it has the reputation it does because it, it actually is that good and it is that important and it is that well made. And more people, you know, there's a lot of questions about political effectiveness, strategy, engagement, communication, which I like have my hands full with other stuff and I'm not going to engage on that level with. But it's always, a, to me, a good thing for people to be reading good art and good comics. And powerful here, here. comics. And like, it, you know, reading this story helped me think of questions to ask my mom about my about her parents that I hadn't thought to ask or remember to ask. It made me understand and process my own family's story in a, in a different way than I had before, just like really different. And I had such important and interesting conversations with my mom just the other day that were, you know, brought on by having read this and realizing there was things I needed to try to understand or, or, or piece together differently. Um, so we've gone for a long time and I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, are there things that you have found a reading mouse through this reread or in this moment now that you didn't really fathom in the same way before? Um, and it's also okay if the answer is, oh my God, it's so late. Go ahead. Well, (laughs) Well, I was going to say, um, you know, I was, um, I was lucky enough to be involved with a really amazing project um, with the poet Cornelius Eady, who's also a musician. And we worked on this project for a a long period of time and put it out last year called the Sterling Brown Project, which is taking a bunch of these Sterling Brown poems and setting them to music. And the, the, you know, the poetry is just extraordinary. And as part of it, I, I did a deep dive into a lot of um, black uh, art and, you know, particularly art that was either, done by folks who had been enslaved or is, is in some way linked to that tradition or the, you know, the wrestling with this history. And I was struck, you know, when I was thinking about and sort of like looking at, looking at some of the imagery from mouse again for the first time in a long time. And, um, you know, there's this incredible, you know, one of the most incredible drawings that just is the one of all of the different, of all the, all the, uh, you know, prisoners at, at Auschwitz and, and they're all in their, you know, striped, um, you know, prison clothes. And it, it is shockingly reminiscent of another painting by a painter named Winfred Rimbert, who I had never heard of before I had worked on this project. And there's something about the, um, the like repetition of like what it, what it looks like when we have fascist systems that, 
you know, dehumanize people and, mm. you know, homogenize them as part of trying to like strip away their humanity. Um, and just how, you know, like the, the kinds of trauma and the, and the, and the process of like processing trauma through art is such a, um, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing to see the different ways in which, um, we keep having to, you know, make beautiful things in order to process the ugliest things you can imagine. So I was excited to, you know, if there's one good thing about this moment, it's getting to come on the podcast and having a, having a reason to go back and look at this beautiful piece of work. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I know I mentioned a bunch of things that I discovered for the or noticed differently this time uh, after I, I've lost kind of the amount of times I've read mouse throughout my life. Um, but one other thing that I, I, I would encourage people to uh, pay attention to uh, if, if they're reading mouse um, again, or, or maybe even if it's their first time, uh, one of the things I, I write about a lot uh, in my work as a critic is metafiction. Uh, it, it's just something I'm utterly fascinated with. And while obviously Mouse is nonfiction, I do think it's a very fascinating piece of what might be considered meta nonfiction. Um, I, I wrote an essay for Neotext Review uh, a little less than a year ago, I think it was, um, with the title... Um, more than the Holocaust comic, quote unquote. And I think one of the frustrating things about Mouse is people talk about it so reductively. Oh, it's that comic about the Holocaust. And for me, especially uh, this time around, because I'm, I'm 30. I'm the age that I I think art was when he began compiling uh, his father's notes Mm-hmm. it's really just as much, if not more art story. It's not, it's, it's not just a comic about the Holocaust. It is about a son trying to understand his father's pain through art, which is obviously his name, but also the, the art, the, the, the practice of creation it's such a powerful thing. And if you're sick of hearing about mouse, I would challenge people to read it again through that lens. Hell yes. Hell yes. Thank you. Uh, on that note, um, I actually ha- I had one more listener question that I wanted to hit and also answer, which I think is a actual good closing on this, which was um, a friend of mine who's also Jewish asked, uh, you know, does any of Mouse not really translate well beyond being a Jewish American text? Um, and, you know, all three of us are Jewish, and we're in, all three of us are Ashkenazi even, which is like a specific subtype. Um, I actually had reached out to a friend whose family survived a completely different atrocity in a completely different continent, um, and who's an artist to come on and join us and share from that perspective, but we weren't really able to get the schedules to line up. Um, because I am really interested in hearing that. But one thing that the person who asked the question said was, I remember that was that was that he remembered there being stuff in Yiddish in the book that he didn't recognize. And I had just handed my my husband, um, who's not Jewish, uh, I w- was just reading the copies for the first time because we we had them here. And I popped over and I'm like, hey, Frank, like, what did was there stuff that you didn't understand in the book? He's like, no, it, it was all translated. And I went and I looked, and it, it it like there's Yiddish in the book, but like it is translated, and it made me think about how memory of what's on the page and what you remember are not are not they're not the same. Um, and so you know maybe what my friend was experiencing in his alienation and confusion in the text when he was reading it when he was younger wasn't actually about not recognizing you know, the Yiddish, maybe it was like something else that he felt like he couldn't access or maybe was distant for. And I should say the friend in question is, is also Jewish. Um, but I've certainly heard from plenty, plenty of 
uh, you know, American folks who are not Jewish about the significance that it meant for them. And um, yeah, Ethan, go ahead. You know, actually my, you know, everyone here shared about their, their family. My family, just, there was no, no one in my immediate family survived the Holocaust. My grandfather actually survived World War II as a prisoner of war in Siberia. Uh, uh, so, oh, so, you know, did, and, so, so did one of my granddads. So did one of my uh, grandpas. Something we should connect about sometime. But yeah, uh, he mm-hmm. was he was in the Polish army and was a prisoner of war in Siberia during the Holocaust. And I actually, unfortunately, cannot ask my mom or my uncle about this now because they've both passed. But I think... I think I remember this. That I think part of their connection to it, like I know my mom was super interested in sort of what you guys were saying about this, you know, that, that it's also the story of the children of survivors. And I think that was actually also very important. And that my mom and her brother really felt that their father had suffered the same sort of trauma and, you know, existed in the same sort of traumatized self as a parent and that they were impacted in that sort of second generation trauma in much the same way that, you know, children of Holocaust survivors were. And that Mouse is also a very important document of, of like that sort of second, you know, that that whole idea of the second and even third generation of generational trauma, I think, was very new at the time Mouse came out. And it is a very yeah. important piece of work and literature about that. And although, you know, it is narrowly very similar to the story of, of Mouse in that it's about Ashkenazi Jews and World War II and the horrible camps. You know, the fact that it wasn't actually exactly the same, that it was Soviet, you know, prisoner of war camps. Still, exactly. It's still, yeah. still my parents felt like it was, it spoke very strongly to them and, and, and had that. I, I can, I was, I was just messaging. I consider my, my grandpa who was in Siberia and camps to also be a Holocaust survivor, just not a, just not a survivor of the specific death camps. Um, because, like the specific things that happened to him were because he was Jewish. Mm. Um, they, cause they, they had Jewish prisoners separated in Siberia and they had different, they had different circumstances than the non-Jewish prisoners of war. But we could talk about that later. Sure. Thank you um, for joining us for this epic moment. And, um, does anybody uh, have a Twitter account or project you'd like to promote to our listeners? Because I know that folks can keep reading Greg's writings on a regular basis in Comics Beat and Silver Linings. And uh, what's your what's your Twitter handle, handle Greg? Uh, you could find me. It's it's real easy. I'm at Greg Silber. That's Silber uh, like silver, but with a B rather than a V. Um, and uh, among you know all the other uh, stuff that I write uh, about comics and whatnot, um, just if you're looking for uh, something a little lighter with Jewish characters, I have a four-page mini comic called Benny Beck Vampire Killer about a uh, Jewish vampire hunter fighting Nazi vampires. It's extremely silly. Uh, I'm working on a second installment with uh, my friend, uh, the the artist, Jonah Newman. Uh, It'll take you literally two minutes, if that, to read. Um, But, uh, you know, we've been getting uh, pretty heavy here tonight, uh, you know, as was necessary for the subject matter. But uh, if if you just want a foul-mouthed Jew beheading Nazi vampires, you know, maybe that'll be a nice palate cleanser for you. Thank you for that. Um, where can folks keep a, an eye on your cartooning work, Ethan? Um, I hesitate to share it because it's very infrequent these days. Because I, as as I was mentioning earlier when we were do, doing sound test, I do have a young kid at home, so I, I have not been producing very much. Uh, I am on Twitter at Freedom Funnies, um, at Freedom Funnies, also on Tumblr. Uh, I just helped edit the new issue of World War III Illustrated, which people who are interested in political comics should definitely check out. And I also did just self-publish, and I should send it to all of you guys. I mean, by say just, I mean, I, it's the most recent thing I did, I, it came out last year, is uh, a zine of comics and political art, both for myself and others, and then also interviews with a couple of cartoonists. 
I interviewed Joe Sacco and Eleanor Davis about sort of politics and comics. Uh, and that zine is called the Chalgosh Syzygy, which good luck. Say that again. The what? Yeah, exactly. Chalgosh, like Leon Chalgosh, the anarchist who assassinated uh, President McKinley, and Syzygy, like the alignment of astronomical bodies. So easy for the SEO. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure everybody will find it immediately. It's a words with all... lot, It's words <laughs> that are fun to write when you're writing them as lettering. Well, we will have a link to that in the listener notes, uh, assuming folks can access that online. And yeah, way, yeah, yes. you can you can buy copies of it cool. online. The Tall Got Sister G. Nice. <laughs> uh, and Leo, where can folks keep an eye on your work? I know you're not uh, on Twitter nearly as much as I wish you were, but that's okay. Yeah, you can be one of the you can be the third person to follow me on Twitter at uh, Leo Ferguson NYC. Um, you can uh, join Jews for Racial and Economic Justice at jfrej.org and you can check out that art I was talking about and some really great music at sterlingbrownproject.com I'm really excited to look at that and of course as for me, uh, Elana Levin who spends too much time on Twitter as Elana Brooklyn, E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn Graphic Policy is my podcast um you know, you're usually here talking with comics artists and writers about their work, about all different kinds of genres and topics, but certainly with a lens that a left-wing political perspective, queer and feminist analysis would bear to bring on such things. Um, and we have some exciting upcoming coverage of some various superhero adjacent TV shows, including the very political peacemaker from whom we have some pretty exciting high profile guests joining us. So thank you for listening. And as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos. Or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.